Good evening, everyone. My name is Bruce Johnson, and I serve the Auxiliary as the Chief of the Youth Programs Division. This evening is our first quarterly All Hands Aux Scout Staff Forum. I hope that all Aux Scout staff were informed about this forum, and I appreciate your questions that were submitted in advance. We're going to start with introductions of the key national and district Aux Scout staff. Following this, we'll cover questions in two broad areas that you submitted. Next, we'll spend some time discussing one or two hot topics that we hope will be useful to you in carrying out your work. Finally, we'll wrap up with some news and final words. Tonight's forum will be between 60 and 90 minutes. We're still just experimenting with this format, and we need to find out what the right amount of time is. Your mics are muted, so please don't try to turn them on. If you have a comment or question, please type it in the chat box. Depending on how the time goes, we may be able to address your chat box questions as time permits. Otherwise, we'll respond in writing after the forum. So let's begin. I'd like to introduce you to our national staff. The Youth Programs Division is part of the National Human Resources Directorate. We have 10 members of the Youth Programs team. We stand ready to help you. Look up the right person's contact information in AUX directory. First up are the three branch chiefs who work directly with your district staff officer. For Atlantic East, Robin Pope, he works with districts 1st Northern, 1st Southern, 5th Northern, 5th Southern, and 7. Atlantic West is Bill Risa. He works with the 8s and the 9s uh, districts. And uh, new to the team is John Michael Zimmerly, who works with the 11s, 13, 14, and 17. Next up are our media and member support teams. Our new marketing and social media person is Bill Smith. Photo archives is Jack Pauley. And heading up our member support area is Amy McNeil. Also on member support is Bart Knapp, who's responsible for new ship organization, and Stefan Recchi, who handles recognition letters. Finally, another new member of our team is J.D. DeCastra, who is heading up our STEM education development efforts. And if that uh, uniform looks a little bit unusual for an auxiliarist, J.D. is also a lieutenant in the U.S. Coast Guard and is a helicopter pilot. Now, I'd like to uh, mention the district staff officers who lead the effort in each of the districts in Atlantic East. First Northern is Jason Oliveira. First Southern is Tom Siniglio. Fifth Northern is Bill Skelly. I head up Fifth Southern. And Seventh District is Jim Roach. Atlantic West. 8th Eastern is Bill Risa, 8th Coastal is Bart Knapp, 8th Western Rivers is Mac McNeil, 9th Eastern, Gene Little, 9th Central, Wade Love, and 9th Western is Roy Bonus. Finally, for the Pacific area, 11th Northern is Steve Johnson, 11th Southern is Dale Zimmerman, D13 is Craig Brown. D14 in Hawaii is Jason Snellings. And D17 in Alaska is Stu Robards. So now we're going to turn to staff questions. First up, several liability and legal questions were submitted from the field. Joining us tonight is Commodore Doug Cream who is the Auxiliary's Chief Counsel. Thank you very much, Commodore, for joining us. And give me a moment, I will turn on his, oh, his mic is on. Commodore? Good evening, Bruce, and good evening, all. You, uh, you wanna 
take it away. We have some questions uh, on the screen for everybody that was submitted ahead of time. Sure, I'd be glad to. So uh, the first question, one of my flotillas is concerned that, that if they have Sea Scouts aboard a facility and a star case comes along, they'll have to put the scouts ashore or not respond to the call. Uh, that's not consistent with the standard operating procedure, which provides that in the event there's a SAR case while we have Sea Scouts aboard, that we are uh, able to respond to the SAR call. Uh, however, the Sea Scouts on board will need to uh, put themselves in a position where they are not in the way of what we're doing and um, they are not to participate in any fashion in the SAR, uh, SAR call out, uh, not handle any uh, lines and so on. The key thing here is to remember that most of what we do and most of what we're going to do uh, with the Sea Scouts are covered by the SOP. So you want to become familiar with the SOP, certainly folks who are doing operations uh, we'll need to become familiar with the standard operating procedure. Thank you, Commodore. The first question, uh, when we talked about this earlier today, you mentioned was really not a question, but uh, expresses a concern about liability exposure uh, working with Sea Scouts in the auxiliary context. Correct. Uh, and it's important to remember that everything we do whether we do the in the capacity of being a member of the auxiliary or whether acting as adults, members of society, everything we do uh, can expose us to some degree of liability. The, our our uh, participation in the Sea Scouts as one of the programs is no different than our participation, for example, as a vessel examiner uh, or in operations. What we have to remember at all times is that while we're following the standard operating procedures, if they exist, whatever guidance documents may be in existence and acting within the scope of our authority, consistent with the auxiliary manual, in the case of operations, of course, consistent with the auxiliary uh, operations policy manual, we are considered employees of the United States of America. And as such, for purposes of liability, we are protected by the Federal Tort Claims Act. Uh, if we're injured, of course, we're protected by the Federal Employee Compensation Act, which is the federal, federal analog to workers' compensation. So the key here, once again, is to remember that we have to operate within the scope of our authority, consistent with, the op consistent with any guidance document, and then we're entitled to protection under the uh, Federal Tort Claims Act. Okay, thank you very much. Let, let me move on to the next screen. Okay, <clears throat> what are the options for handling boat donations? Okay. Donations of boats are covered by a guidance document that was prepared by National Commodore Mal Malison uh, during his term in office. It's something that your uh, district staff officer for legal will be familiar with. And of course, uh, my, my assistants, the assistant chief counsels for the areas, my deputy chief and myself are available to provide assistance to the DSOLPs. The basic principle is that the donations of vessels a donation of any facility, whether it's a radio facility or a uh, surface facility, is going to be made to the auxiliary unit that is has chartered the uh, Sea Scout ship. So it will become the property of the auxiliary unit. And we have uh, some fairly detailed uh, operations procedures for how that's handled. If, if it arises, then the need, of course, is for you to consult with your DSOOP. Okay, thank you very much. The next question, if a flotilla or division takes over an existing ship's charter, how should property asset transferred be handled? I'm thinking about ships that have larger sailboats or powerboats. All right, if, if it's a facility, a, a vessel that the auxiliary unit wishes to take, wishes to use, uh, wishes to become the owner of, then the transfer again will be handled in accordance with the guidance documents that 
uh, uh, controlled the transfer of uh, of property to auxiliary uh, to the auxiliary, and again, that's where your DSOLP will come in uh, to assist. Okay, and a, a related question: Is there an established process for disbanding a ship if a flotilla or division votes to disband it? Can the charter be transferred to another organization, or must the ship be dissolved? and the scouts transfer to another ship. Okay, if a sea ship, uh, I'm sorry, if a scout uh, ship is being dissolved, uh, then the, uh, the flotilla may transfer or division, whatever the unit is, may transfer that the charter to another unit of the auxiliary. Uh, that, that transfer will have to be, of course, accomplished in coordination with whatever unit may be taking over. But the, the straight and simple answer is yes, it can be transferred to another uh, unit within the auxiliary. And of course, it's not required that the ship be dissolved. If the ship is dissolved, the scouts, of course, can transfer to another sea, sea scout ship. That's exactly right. All right, let me see. Okay, here we have a question about the 7020 Alpha uh, media release form. Wouldn't it be better if the local flotilla kept a copy of the press release form for the scouts so that the flotilla knows which photos the scouts can, uh, they can use uh, for public affairs and press releases? As a former scout leader, our troop just kept a copy. Yeah, that's because it was a scout troop that had the copies. The auxiliary does not want to maintain records of scouts' personal identifiable information, which would be on that form, as you can see up on the screen. It contains the address uh, of, of the scout. What I would suggest that you do, and I certainly get the point that you want to be, you want to know whether a particular scout uh, or scouts' parents, I should say, has executed the uh, release for photographs. You can, you may simply keep a list or a log of which scouts have uh, have that on file, and then you can maintain that log electronically so that it's easily available. But uh, we do not, in the auxiliary, we do not want to maintain uh, records of scouts' personally identifiable information. And as a reminder, this form, once it's been completed, uh, gets sent by the flotilla to the Coast Guard Auxiliary Association, which will uh, maintain custody of the form. Exactly right. And so if there arises a question at some point with respect to whether there is a photo release on file, uh, the Auxiliary Association would be the uh, would be the folks that are holding the the copies. Obviously, whether you can obtain information immediately uh, would depend on the time of the day and the day of the week. Uh, it is manned. Uh, well, it's normally manned. I was going to say uh, five days a week from nine to five. These days, of course, uh, there's an entirely different schedule. Right. Now I see in the chat box. Uh, I'm going to read a, a question. It has some um, information that isn't correct, but I'm sure it's a commonly held belief. Uh, this individual is saying, if a Sea Scout ship has boats, those boats belong to BSA, even if the ship is chartered to the auxiliary. If the vessels are owned by the auxiliary and provided by the ship, then the vessels come back to the auxiliary. Well, to, to begin with, uh, vessels, are not owned by the Boy Scouts of America on behalf of the ship. Uh, and what's more, the ship cannot own uh, the vessels themselves. If a ship uh, uh, nominally controls a vessel, it's actually owned by the chartered organization. So um, if, for example, a vessel uh, that is used by a Sea Scout ship that's chartered to an auxiliary flotilla. If the flotilla owns the boat, then it is the flotilla's boat and not the Boy Scouts of America's boat. That's the difference between the Boy Scouts of America and the Girl Scouts. And keep in mind that if, and keep in mind that 
any vessel that's owned by the auxiliary has to be operated under orders and consistent with uh, all of the guidance documents and most particularly the operations policy manual. Thank you. Uh, exactly so. Uh, we have a follow-up question on the 7020 Alpha. So there is no problem with keeping a copy of the 7020 while forwarding the original. The answer is no. We do not retain copies of the 7020. Uh, if right. the, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, what what I was saying was that what we can do is we can maintain a log of the names of the scouts for whom we have uh, received a photo release. But beyond the name of the scout, no other information should be retained. Correct. And that, by the way, is by agreement with the scouts. I and mean, all, all of these things that you're hearing were worked out uh, between the auxiliary and the scouts at the very beginning of this program. Yes. So it's not, it's not susceptible to, well, let's do it this way instead of that way. Right, and and a follow-up question from the same individual. So can the uh, Sea Scout ship uh, maintain a copy of their forms consistent with BSA policy? There's certainly no problem with that, but that's not a, we as auxiliarists are not retaining copies of these forms. Okay. Um, I think we have covered all of the legal and liability questions. If you have, if anybody has follow-up questions about either liability or legal issues, we would encourage you to take them to your district's DSO LP. They're your first line of defense, and uh, if they don't have the answer, they have a full backup that they can get the answers that you're looking for. Thank you very much, Commodore. You're, you're welcome, Bruce. Thank you for all of the work you and your staff is doing to promote this extremely valuable program. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Okay, thank you very much. Now let's uh, discuss our training related questions. This first question, I have to confess to you, came from me because I get this question very often and there seems to be some confusion on this subject, but what training is required for all Ox Scout staff officers? Now, there's a reason for this and all of this is stipulated in the SOP. An Ox Scout staff officer is expected to take BSA Youth Protection Training and remember that you have to take this training every 24 months just as any BSA adult leader would have to. Uh, you're also expected to take the Sea Scout adult leader basic training, BSA safety afloat training, BSA safe swim defense training, as, as would be the case with any other staff or elected officer position, you're expected to be current with your auxiliary core training, be thoroughly familiar with the BSA Auxiliary Memorandum of Agreement, which is posted on Oxby Wiki. Be thoroughly familiar with the Ox Scout Standard Operating Procedure, or SOP, which is posted on Oxby Wiki. Become thoroughly familiar with Oxby Wiki. And attend as many Ox Scout online workshops as possible. Remember that the key point here is that you are the uh, subject matter expert on Ox Scout, and your shipmates will be looking to you for authoritative information about the program. Now, of course, you can't possibly know everything about the program, but the more you know up front, the better and more effective you'll be at doing your job. Of course, it's always okay if you don't know the answer to a question to say, gee, I don't know, I'll check on that and get back to you. And then you have a full uh, a spread of support uh, from your DSO, from the, my uh, staff, and from me. We can get you the answers. And uh, I can tell you that I am the program lead for this effort. If I don't know the answer, and there are a few cases where I don't, 
I can go to the highest level and get answers for you very quickly. So um, don't make up an answer if you're not sure, uh, but do make sure that you get, you get fully trained and that you've read through all of the supporting material that we've uh, developed for you. So the next question is, does the entire flotilla need youth protection training if they're involved in any activities, including meetings with the youth? Well, um, the answer for this is in the SOP. Um, if all your flotilla is doing is hosting some Sea Scouts at a flotilla meeting, then no, you are not required to take youth protection training. However, there are a whole host of activities that would cause you to need to do to take a youth protection training, but it's not a blanket requirement. Uh, there nowhere is it required that the entire flotilla take youth protection training. Of course, the Coast Guard is strongly encouraging everybody to take this training, and there are certain uh, positions where you have to take the training. Uh, to begin with, um, a, uh, a AUK Scout staff officer at any level has to take this training. If the flotilla charters a Sea Scout ship, then the flotilla commander, the vice commander, the HR staff officer, the member training staff officer, and the operations staff officer have to take the training. Additionally, if there are others in the flotilla who work directly with the youth, and the Coast Guard's definition of working directly with the youth is coming into contact with them at least once a year. And it doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. It can be via email. It can be over uh, social media. Um, there are a variety of different ways. Uh, then you have to take this training. Specifically exempted from this is anybody teaching a public education course where the general public is invited to the training. In that case, the instructors are not required to take youth protection training. Um, a follow-up question to this was, do you need to be a BSA member to take youth protection training or Sea Scout uh, adult leader basic training? The answer is no. The myscouting.org site uh, will allow you to create a login without being a BSA member. And it doesn't matter whether you are, uh, if you were a former BSA member but are no longer, don't worry about that. Just create a login for yourself and you can take uh, any training that's available on the myscouting.org uh, uh, training site. Uh, all of that training is free and your information will be protected. The only uh, uh, information that BSA is collecting is your completion of the training course. You will not be contacted with any follow-up marketing or anything else of that nature. Another question related to training, do training completion certificates need to be submitted to the auxiliary or does the SOAS just hold certificates? Again, this is in the SOP. So please, please, please read through the SOP very carefully. The instruction is that your youth protection training completion certificate should be given to your flotilla commander and your flotilla commander will forward it to your district's director of auxiliary or DIROX office which will then input it into your AUX data training record. Now, notice I just said youth protection training, and there is other training that is required of certain other people. Um, right now, AUX data can only handle youth protection training completions. Uh, in a few months, it will be able to handle other completions of BSA training courses that we require under certain circumstances. But as of today, it can only handle youth protection training. And as I'm sure you've all heard, uh, there's going to be a resystemization of AUX data uh, that will be getting rolled out in the next few weeks. 
A uh, question came in about sea badge training. This training, while it is really good and it would really help you with your understanding of the Sea Scout program, uh, it is not a required course. It's a weekend seminar that's uh, held face to face. Um, there were going to be four Sea Badge courses uh, in April, and of course, all of them have been canceled. Uh, as of today, there are three courses on the books for the fall, one in September at the Maine Maritime Academy, one in October in central New York State, and one in Monterey, California. I haven't gotten the dates on those yet. I have a, a an email in to the training chair for the Sea Scout program, and she is running down those dates for us, and I'll get get that up on the Facebook page as soon as I have that. Uh, and she also noted that they're considering uh, doing a Sea Badge conference over Zoom um, in part to try to take up the slack for uh, the canceled courses. They haven't decided definitely that they're going to do it, and it's not because they can't do it. It's just that uh, Sea Badge has always been offered as a face-to-face -face training experience in the past, and having attended and led uh, Sea Badge conferences myself, I can tell you that the in-person discussion is uh, just as important as the training content. So I will let everybody know as soon as I have more information on that. So next up we have discussion topics and uh, we're going to try to cover two topics. One is online communication and the other is new ship organization. Uh, the one that is especially important for us to cover this evening is online communication because just about everybody on this call is uh, living in a state where the governor is saying you cannot go out or you should not go out. And besides which, uh, the Coast Guard has told us that we should not be going out to do our Coast Guard uh, responsibilities. So um, there was a really good uh, discussion uh, last week uh, for Sea Scout skippers on this subject, and I have asked uh, Robin Pope and uh, Tom Siniglio to uh, to uh, lead a discussion on what's involved. And, and here are the questions that you submitted. How do we develop ships and partnerships between Sea Scouts and the Auxiliary when we can't meet face-to-face -face and can't get out on the water? The next question, what can we do at home while waiting for current restrictions to lift? With the order to stand down, there's not been a whole lot of activity, so we decided to start a new Zoom subscription. The first meeting is today with weekly meetings Tuesdays and Thursdays. What methods are working for other flotillas and what should we do, be doing to prepare to spin up once current restrictions lift? Now I've unmuted Robin and I've tried to unmute Tom Siniglio, but I think he's, there he goes. There, okay, both of them have live mics now and I'm going to turn it over to them. And they had a few slides. Uh, so I'll let them, let them drive this discussion going, uh, going forward here. Bruce, thank you very much. Um, Tom and I, this, this is Robin Pope. Uh, Tom, we, I believe we had spoken this morning and that uh, I'll take the first and the third question talking about communication options and you'll focus more on what to communicate about. Is that still okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so the, the first and third questions really focus on how we can communicate. So if you want to go to the next slide, Bruce. Um, there are a number of options that, that flotillas and that Sea Scout ships have been using. Uh, the third question mentioned Zoom, and that's been a very popular option. Uh, I know a lot of, of both ships and troops are using that, and flotillas are using it for their own meetings. Uh, free conference call is also an effective system uh, that allows both teleconference and screen sharing. 
Other options that have been successful are using Facebook and other social media options. Um, there are some questions there about ensuring privacy of the group and whether you want the group to be private. Within my own Sea Scout ship, we've opted for a, an open uh, forum and we're just very careful about not putting any identifying information on it. Uh, using the telephone is, I guess, old fashioned at this point, but it, it is certainly an effective way to get one to one communication. And uh, I think that it is the next best thing to the face to face communication because it allows you to have a private conversation with someone. Uh, and then email is, is also working very effectively. Uh, within my own ship, we're using email frequently to exchange information. Uh, we've put out work assignments and worksheets for, for scouts to fill out and send back in, essentially for grading, uh, treating it almost like homework assignments. Next slide, please. So who should we communicate with and how can we develop relationships while we are stuck in our house? And I would say that the first thing we want to do is look within and try to develop and strengthen what we already have. Uh, this health crisis is going to go away eventually and we are going to get back out on the water. And the stronger we are within existing units when that happens, the more successful that will be. Uh, so the, the first thing I would suggest is reaching in, making sure that, that you're reaching out to existing members and just doing status checks, making sure that everyone is doing well, that they're staying healthy, and making sure that they don't have any needs that, that members of the ship or the flotilla can help with. This is a great time for units to start doing planning and start looking for what their next adventure is going to be once this health crisis goes away. Um, it's also a way to look at planning for uh, bridges of honor and advancements and uh, things that are necessary to achieve higher rank. And finally, that reaching in is a good way to have some type of social interaction. At this time when we're not supposed to be in person with people, uh, people can certainly start feeling lonely, uh, forget that they do have friends and social interaction, reaching out to them through the phone, through social media, uh, within your units will help maintain that, that cohesion that's gonna make a, a unit successful. When we think about reaching out, we can use these same concepts. Even though we can't get face-to-face, -face, uh, this is a good time to get online, find contacts for other organizations that we wanna work with, uh, start calling, uh, scout units and uh, discuss ways to partner with them, call scout councils and find out people that are interested in starting up ships. And once we have that contact list, a lot of work can be done by telephone or by email to get the ball rolling so that when we can get out together, uh, we can do that. A key guideline for all of these is to remember that we do need to follow youth protection guidelines anytime youth are involved. Youth protection for social media, for telephone and, and text and email simply says that we should not have one-on-one -on -one contact. Uh, good policy is that if you're going to be involving a scout with any of those communications, simply copy their parent when you're doing that. Uh, that makes sure the parents are fully aware of anything that's going on. Um, another option is uh, going to be not only contacting the parent, but also contacting a second leader within your own organization. Again, just following all the precepts of youth protection, uh, making sure that everything is, is done, not just to the letter of the law, but to the intent of the law. Um, and Tom, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm seeing in the chat, um, are there any thoughts about the ABS or BSNS via Zoom, et cetera, to provide reach out uh, training? Um, before I get into that, I, I asked my uh, state liaison, I, and our state doesn't allow that uh, online. So your state may or may not. So, you know, please contact your state liaison. But um, as of right now, I mean, anything can change as, as we'll, we are well aware of. <laughs> um, but at this time, the various state legislatures haven't thought through the process. Um, if you were to buy a boat today and you didn't have a license, there's no place for you to take a license in Connecticut. So 
they might grant you a 30 or 60 or 90 day waiver for higher apps, or they might not enforce the rules. Those are, those are options, but uh, you don't want to be the person that uh, is unprepared because they can uh, they can still give you a ticket uh, if you're not following the rules. So I, I hope that answers the question about the boating uh, NESBLA uh, classes. Again, it, it depends on the state. Thanks. Okay, so one of the things we can uh, teach on our navigation, both rules and practice, celestial navigation, which uh, is very interesting now because um, uh, people can actually see the, sky, uh, the stars at night because they're home. Um, we can read charts, maps, guidebooks. We can plan our next short cruise or long cruise or uh, joint uh, rendezvous. Even if it doesn't happen this year, I, I don't want to surprise anybody, but you can plan it with the date to be determined. But you can do all the physical work and budgets and planning and um, you know bylaws and you know everything else you need shy of getting on board right now so please take advantage of this time um, review and learn the parts of the boats parts of the anchors and other maritime lore that's a great uh, thing for the youth to um, take a hold of because it's part of their advancements for the various uh, Sea Scout ranks. And um, it's also very good for auxiliarists who maybe were in the army <laughs> or uh, never had the military experience or were never in the Navy or the Coast Guard. So a lot of these things might be like Latin. So now's a great time for us all to learn from each other. You can learn and practice knots, both um, right-handed, left-handed, blindfolded, upside down, uh, in the dark, uh, and um, easy ones, trick ones, all the kinds of knots that we have available. It's just like when uh, sailors of old were at sea for six months or a year, they didn't have internet, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have uh, iPads, uh, they had a, a string of rope, so they got very crafty. And uh, maybe we might wanna think about doing some lanyards or some uh, heaving lines or key fobs, et cetera. Uh, you can use videos on YouTube or Vimeos have been very um, um, resourceful and useful. You just please view them first before you put them online because um, not everything you see on the internet is true. I, I just want to break that to everybody. I wasn't sure if you've heard that before, but not everything on the internet is true. So please you know, trust but verify. And um, you can also learn new skills like for instance, semaphore or um, Morse code, or uh, you can show the younger kids what a telephone was or what a, uh, you know, a, a tape recorder was because to them, they had no idea. You can repair your personal equipment or show people how to do repairs, okay? Um, you can, again, work on your advancements, both in the Coast Guard Auxiliary, um, you can study the Ox Op or the um, boat crew or air crew. There's a bunch of Quizlets, and that's a Q-I-Z-L-E-T, um, where various um, people before us have made um, flashcards, and it helps you to study for Ox Sea or Ox Weather, um, Oxcom and, and things of that nature. So please try and um, take advantage of this time and keep track of your time, both for uh, scouting purposes, Ox Scout, and for the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Um, practice your radio skills, the pronunciation. Um, you can um, explain to people if they put their video on the difference between um, Vo uh, voice communication and nonverbal communication, and you can try and figure out what people are doing or saying. Um, we've also had uh, an instance where there was a, a deaf person. So a deaf person wanted to be in on the training, and normally they wouldn't get much out of the training because everybody's 
on a phone call and they can't necessarily hear. But with a video, someone can sign or or show the pictures and they can uh, figure it out. So that can also help uh, flotilla meetings or uh, the disabled um, scouts or scout leaders, uh, adults rather. Um, I also encourage the leaders uh, and the um, parents rather to be on the uh, teleconference calls because a lot of times there's a question and um, you know the scout is kind of torn between doing their homework and doing their scout work and we don't want to supersede any of their homework but there's times when we're sure they have slack time um, also when we say practice radio skills the other thing that um, I think is really great is we could do comparisons be between ships and between flotillas of what radios they liked, what they didn't like, whether it was handheld or stationary, and also uh, possibly do some shopping or, or um, you know, trading or backfilling. Um, next slide, please. All right. And how will everything change things after the emergency? Well, I, I want to have you step back in time for a little bit. Um, 1969, the um, Apollo mission had something called TANG, T-A-N-G, changed the way we had our drinks. Aluminum foil changed the way we did our things. TV dinners changed the way we did our things. Um, the slide rule and uh, eventually computers came on board. Um, a lot of things like the tapes, uh, you know, the scotch tape, I mean, um, duct tape and things came about. So please remember those days and then maybe forward your mind to 9-11, to, uh, how airline traffic has changed and how our security has changed and, and, and the, the way we approach things uh, and we, we prepare for things. Well, this has always been a situation. Um, we've always had germs. It's just we've never had 24-7 everybody um, talking about it at the same time. So that's the, the difference between having the social media and the 24-hour news cycle and the ability to get stats and people to move uh, tall buildings in a single bound. So please, um, again, have patience and be receptive to change if possible. But again, keeping the uh, personal information secret and not um, letting people spoil your meetings or spoil your units uh, because they were not invited. So what we don't know is there may be restrictions on meeting and activity still. Um, guidelines for long cruises might change. Uh, we might have to have a medical officer on board perhaps or someone who is advanced level of an EMT. That might be a, a possible consideration. We might have to have several people um, CPR certified or uh, you know AED certified or have masks now and, and gloves in our um, first aid kits and our you know uh, go to sea bags. Um, there must, there might be limits on when and where we can meet. Again, that maybe the number of uh, six feet or eight feet or ten feet separation might be a standard for us. Uh, going forward, it might very well be. And um, again, wearing masks when you're sick, uh, if you have to go out rather than, and, and if not, uh, you know, stay home. That still might be um, a prudent advice. So whatever happens, we should focus on doing the best we can with the situation at hand, trying to do the next good thing in front of us, and then moving to the next good thing. Um, we want to keep um, a cheerful spirit that we want to have the scout spirit at all times. We want to um, make sure we're not passing bad information. Uh, we don't want to circulate rumors. Uh, we don't want to make people unnecessarily afraid. And we want to, you know, listen to our um, chain of leadership, listen to um, our organizations, and 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 do the best we can. Here's some training resources available links. Um, and again, you can use Google or the various search engines 
to find out anything you ever wanted to um, know about anything um, with the maritime history or parts of a vessel or any re advancement or requirement um, that someone's wrote about it, done the test, put it online, emailed it so that image or whatever is available. Uh, then it goes along with animated knots. You can slow slow motion them. You can go backwards. You can pause. You can wait till everybody gets on the same page. Um, is there? Let's see. I think has any questions that I, I can answer. Well, I wanted to take this opportunity to remind everybody that since we have a little bit more slack time, or many of us do, uh, you should take advantage of this time to take care of your required uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary training. Uh, do some things ahead. For example, I did. I wasn't due to, to who retake my core uh, uh, courses for another two years, but I took care of that since I had a little extra time. Uh, as well, there are some really good training on the myscouting.org site, and you might want to just try out something that isn't specifically sea scouting, like there's a, a really good uh, training course on weather emergencies that you're not required to take, but BSA's put a lot of thought behind it, and it's really good guidance that you might want to consider when you're getting ready to do a patrol. Um, Okay. I, I just have one, one or two more things um, mm -hmm. for the good of the uh, order. Um, hopefully, we are contacting our flotilla members either by phone, um, by email, or by this uh, video conferencing and just checking in on them, making sure that they have what they need because not only does the con uh, Coast Guard not brag on itself, but the Coast Guard Auxiliary doesn't um, you know, gain a lot of attention and a lot of the members we're already home but hiding before uh, this uh, virus came out. And the same thing has happened with scouts and parents. They might not, because of pride or lack of having a, a computer or n not having the funds for for internet or something, they, not, they might not be able to access this information. So please reach out to them. We don't want to hear that, you know, someone hurt themselves or was admitted to a hospital or or had uh, other psychological or other emotional issues because no one cared no one no one interested so please take this time to you know be as human as we can without you know physically touching each other if you haven't spoken to your mom or dad and they're still available please do that <laughs> you'd be surprised how many kids um want to talk to their aunt and uncle or grandparents and they just don't know enough to ask or you know how to get a, a, in contact with them so please um you know reach out that way I, I think this is probably more like what our future is going to be um using the technology um, when we physically can't be with someone um because of you know various emergencies so that's what i've got thank you thanks very much tom um, and, and I wanted to reinforce something that Tom just said. Um, I'm checking up on my staff, my team of 10 people, uh, once a week. Uh, I'm doing it in part because I want to, and in part because that's what we're doing on the national staff. So you might want to consider checking in on your team and finding out how they're doing, asking if there's anything that you can do for them. Um, you know, we're all feeling a little bit isolated right now, and just that personal contact is really important. And uh, to reinforce something that uh, Robin said uh, a few minutes ago, uh, this this hits teenagers particularly hard. And uh, if we can help the Sea Scouts to meet the needs of the teenagers of our communities, I think we'll be doing a very, very valuable service to them and to all of us, because they need to have our our concern and their in our contact. Uh, let's see. I, I wanted to handle uh, one question that came up. Uh, while we are t handling this, and then we'll move on to new ship organization. There was a question that came in about um, uh, Sea Scout cruises. 
Um, the question reads, most auxiliary missions are short-term missions of eight hours or less. I assume what we're talking about is on-the-water missions. Sea Scout cruises can be overnight or several days. If there is an auxiliary chartered uh, ship involved, how will orders be issued for those long-term missions and cruises? Well, of, of course, if the, the vessel is not owned by the flotilla, then this is not an issue because you wouldn't be under orders. Uh, if it is an auxiliary owned vessel, uh, I think we'll have to find out what the guidance is. I imagine that there's something in the auxiliary operations policy manual, but I don't know that for certain. Um, uh, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind emailing me that question, I will run that up the chain and see if there's any guidance on how to handle that. I suspect that that's going to be a pretty unusual situation. Uh, and remember that if uh, an auxiliarist uh, owns a vessel that is an OPVAC, but the uh, vessel is not being used as an OPVAC uh, with the Sea Scouts, there's no need for there to be orders. On the other hand, if it's being used as an OPVAC and you're under orders, then you obviously have to uh, follow the uh, Coast Guard's policy but guidance on that. So I would like to move on to uh, some questions about new ship organization. Uh, our resident expert on ship organization is Bart Knapp, who also serves as the DSOAS for 8th Coastal. Bart, I'm going to turn this over to you. Uh, we have a number of questions that have come in, and we're looking for your expert guidance. Uh, the first, okay. let me read the first question okay. for you. When starting a new ship, what's the best method for recruiting the first five youths? I don't know if there is a best method. There are multiple methods. Um, you can tr work with, you know, tried and true, especially if you have some members who are associated with troops or active in the local council. You can uh, do presentations to troop meetings, district roundtables, OA events, camperies. Um, you can also check with the local council, uh, see if you can get a list of dropped youth. Uh, very often, and they will have the reason, should have the reasons for the dropping, for, for the reason the youth got out of the uh, scouting program. And they uh, generally will uh, let you have access to that list so you can contact those former scouting members. Um, you can work uh, churches, organizations with youth groups, schools, sailing clubs, yacht clubs, etc. cetera. Um, if you are a teacher, or know a teacher, are married to one, uh, they could be, in, in, especially if they're in the uh, junior high, uh, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, seventh and eighth grade uh, 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 level of teaching, uh, math and science especially, uh, they could be wonderful recruiting tools. Um, other options, scouting, um, some, some, Councils uh, have, might have uh, a position called a new member coordinator, and you might contact them. They have for districts and for council. Uh, they're they're there to help new units uh, get started and work through uh, the first, you know, basically the first year of existence. Um, also in cscout.org, they there is a uh, section called marketing toolbox. And they, that has a number of uh, videos, especially um, YouTube videos that you could use for recruiting or giving, giving you some ideas for uh, recruiting. Um, there's another one that I know that was talked about earlier or about, probably about a year ago, year or so ago, uh, called uh, geofencing and combining that with Facebook. Um, that might be more for for a, for a unit for a ship that's already in existence, but uh, there were some uh, ships that used it and reported some very good results from it. And and um, I should 
mention, I'm sorry to break in, uh, Bart, but okay. there there is a video on the Sea Scouts BSA YouTube channel that explains exactly how to go about doing that. Uh, they report really, really good results from doing that sort of thing. So you might want to look into that. Right, right. Um, you know, it, it it, it, it's it, to a good extent. It's your imagination and your and good old elbow grease, <laughs> right? Is 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 the best way I can say for it. Uh, you might you might be lucky and just happen to drop in and say, oh, well, we've been, we've had some people inquiring about wanting to start a Sea Scout ship. Here that here, here they are. <laughs> uh, yeah. That has happened. <laughs> It is important to mention that your local scout council does not maintain a list of scouts that or teenagers who are just waiting to join a sea scout ship. Um, uh, the question is the right one, how to go about recruiting people. And Bart has given you a number of really good strategies for handling that. Let's move on to the second question. I made a sales presentation and no one contacted me afterwards asking for more information or possibly wanting to join. What should I do next? How do you follow up from a sales presentation? Well, I, um, to me, when, I, I guess my, my first question, did you get their contact information? And then the question would be, is can we, can we actually do that for purposes of recruiting into, the, into a Sea Scout ship? Um, uh, it recruiting and sales presentation. You can do a sales presentation, but it, 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 I think I think you really have to effectively ask for the sale. Are you interested? Can I get information to give you more more? Uh, can I get your information to give you more information about the program? Uh, Try to have a uh, try to have some type of an event, an open house, uh, an activity, a meeting that you can specifically invite them to and give them that information. Uh, um, well, you're other than that, I, I, you know, <laughs> well, well, recruiting is difficult, and, and in, you know, and getting a sale is difficult if you look at it that way, and you know. If you get one in 10, you're doing extremely well. Let me uh, mention a couple of things to keep in mind when you do a sales presentation on this. You need to consider the audience that you're presenting to. Uh, an awful lot of the sales materials that the Coast Guard Auxiliary has are not aimed at the teenage marketplace. Um, a lot of our literature shows a lot of people who are 60, 70, 80 years old um, with a lot of gray hair, uh, a lot of uh, older men. I'm sorry to say that since I am one of them. Um, and what we need to be considering is what do they want? So become familiar with what the Sea Scout program is. Remember that this is a program for teenagers and it's a program that they run. So what is it that they're looking to do? Well, of course, they're looking to become uh, very knowledgeable boaters. They're looking to develop leadership skills. They're also looking to check out uh, career opportunities. Those career opportunities could be military, it could be maritime. So tailor your sales presentation to any of those things. You're not trying to uh, say, here we are, come join us. You're trying to say, this is what we have to offer you, and this is what how we can help you. So that may make you a little bit more uh, successful with your sales presentation. But you do have to be, um, you have to be willing to ask that question that, that Bart asked was, so uh, does this look like this is something that you're interested in? Um, how can we follow up on this? Okay, next question. There hasn't been a, lar a large Sea Scout presence, probably any Sea Scout presence, recently in our division's AOR. 
Our four flotillas have limited resources and limited experience working with scouts. What advice do you have for implementing the Ox Scout program in our division? Uh, well, let me start out first with saying, okay, if, if you're in a division and you're AOR and you have no Sea Scout ships in it, it's going to take a time. It's going to take time to build relationships to the point where you can get uh, youth and adults uh, interested in Sea Scouts. Um, even regardless of the size of your flotilla, you, you, I would really uh, encourage having at least one member either step forward, volunteer, or voluntold, and preferably not that, uh, to work the Ox Scout program, to get to know uh, the local people in the local council, the district executive, the uh, district commissioner, or council commissioner, um, your membership, your district membership, chair, your council membership chair. Um, and how do you get those names? If you don't know, uh, that's you go to your SOAS and he works with the uh, BSA uh, area commodore to, do, uh, to help that. Uh, the commodore should know, the area commodore should have the contact names and information <clears throat> for, all the, uh, for all the councils in their area. And he would be able to give you the uh, uh, he or she would be able to give you the information you need to make contact with the council. Um, it is not going to you don't go in with this uh, when you do make contact. You don't go in with all, with all guns blazing. You kind of do a, a reconnaissance mission. You find out what they're doing. Uh, let them see you. Let them get to know you. Uh, you know create a personal relationship with members in the council, in the troop. If you have the opportunity uh, and have the time, <clears throat> maybe maybe uh, volunteer for, for a district or troop position just to kind of get into that program. Um, if, there, if there's just a few ships or one ship in your area, um, Get the name of the skipper. Uh, our one of our areas, <clears throat> one of our yeah, one of our one of our divisions uh, had has a situation where there's one ship and one flotilla, um, and the the flotilla uh, commander uh, contacted me to get information to contact the skipper of the ship that it, that's in their uh, AOR, and he wanted to. Have them uh, participate in Reese Across America. Anyway, the uh, skipper and the uh, flotilla commander got they got in touch with each other, and they talked. And in January, the uh, uh, ship was invited to the flotilla meeting. I think uh, it was like five five or six youth and five adults attended, uh, and they've continued to build that relationship. And I understand that one of the members, one of the auxiliary members, is now providing a slip for uh, the Sea Scout ship, and that the Sea Scout ship skipper is going to be joining the flotilla. So, you know, that that was over a period of what uh, three or four months, but it it uh, resulted from the auxiliary uh, flotilla commander taking the initiative to contact the Sea Scout ship. And sea I, Scouts are, are as interested in this as as are the auxiliary. Go ahead. And and uh, let me uh, uh, extend on some of, the, some of what you've just said. First of all, uh, we should point out that only about 60% of the Scout Councils have any Sea Scouting. So, um, there are a lot of councils that have no knowledge about the Sea Scout program. Uh, some of them may even be under the impression that that program uh, disbanded many decades ago, and we're working on trying to fix that problem. Um, but uh, Bart is exactly right. Build, building those relationships with uh, local units that do exist 
and where there aren't uh, units, becoming familiar with who's involved in the local scouting experience. Uh, it shouldn't be a surprise that um, the scouting is just as dependent as the auxiliary is on the personal relationships that people develop over time. Now, the auxiliary is as far in a concept to many scouters is as scouting is to many auxiliaries. So we're just trying to uh, make ourselves uh, known to them. You're going to find that uh, a few scouters are going to remember some unfortunate uh, uh, experience they had with the auxiliary 40 years ago and that somehow things have not changed and that uh, things can't work out. Uh, it's your patient working with them that will change it, and it will make a difference. These young people will decide that they want to work with you. Some of them and their parents and their leaders will decide that they want to join your flotilla, and your flotilla will be stronger because of it. Sorry to have gone on uh, gone on the soapbox, but I, I wanted to mention well, that's that. That's all right. I did, I did have one little note here. Consider this as a mission you have been assigned to accomplish, because every you know, this is a, this is as important to the um, active duty side uh, as it is to the auxiliary side. Um, to to have uh, to uh, produce a strong aux scout program. That's exactly right. Uh, we would not have gotten the green light to go forward with this. If the Commandant was not 100% behind this, the Rear Admiral responsible for recruiting, ForceCom at Coast Guard Headquarters, really wants to see this succeed. And our National Commodore, uh, Commodore King, uh, sees this as one of the most important missions that we have to ensure that this program is successful. Now, the final question isn't really a BART question, but how many flotillas are active with Aux Scout, and is there a list somewhere that I could tap into? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, there are quite a few flotillas that are working on this program. Uh, one of the reasons that we I don't know the answer to that was when the SOP was issued uh, back uh, in November, uh, we were not authorized to have a flotilla staff officer for Aux Scout, and uh, I, under new business at the end, I'll tell you where that's going, but I have some good news on that. So, um, but in the meantime, if you haven't already done so, uh, if you do Facebook, you should plan on becoming a member of the Aux Scout Facebook group. Um, uh, it's a great way to connect with other uh, auxiliaries and Sea Scout leaders uh, who uh, have an interest in working together and uh, you'll get a sense of the community. Um, the fact that that group has, uh, when I checked it earlier today, it has 716 participants. So it's a very lively group and there are a lot of people who are very actively engaged there. So thank you very much, Bart. That was really helpful. and. Uh, for those of you who have um, participated in them before, Bart has delivered a couple of uh, workshops on organizing new Sea Scout ships, and we can do more workshops on that if you would like in the future. Now, um, we're already past the one hour point, and I uh, just wanted to mention a couple of uh, topics that we're not going to be able to discuss uh, tonight but I want you to know that we need your input. We have a new uh, gentleman responsible for our media and uh, um, public affairs efforts, Bill Smith, and his question to all of you is, what do we think our Aux Scout or Sea Scout story is, and how should we be telling it? Now, Bill's uh, email address is up there on the screen bill.smith at cgoxnet.us. I picked this photograph in particular uh, because it shows uh, several Sea Scouts from ship 16, which is the current national flagship. 
And the gentleman in the blue shirt is the district commander of D5. Uh, and um, he's a big proponent of what we're doing here. We are training young people who he is hoping is going to uh, join uh, the Coast Guard in due course. So this is this was in uh, Portsmouth, Virginia, a little earlier uh, last year, and uh, the Coast Guard is a big supporter of this. So what do we think our Ox Scout Sea Scout story is, and how should we tell it? Please reach out to Bill, and uh, if you are working on a newsletter article or other public affairs uh, activities. Bill is the pro. He knows uh, knows the rules, and he know, he is a uh, uh, communication specialist, and he would be happy to help you with your efforts in that regard. Okay, so the next question, again, we don't have time to get into in any detail. Uh, I've recently uh, hired uh, uh, J.D. DeCastra. Uh, he's a lieutenant with the Coast Guard, and he's also a Coast Guard Auxiliarist, and he's heading up our uh, STEM education development efforts, and he's working on several projects right now, but his question to the group is, what STEM programs would you like to see? So um, uh, JD's uh, addressing email address, john.d.decastra at uscg.mil. Um, please drop him a note. Uh, he's working hard for us. He's also a new dad, um, as well as being uh, a helicopter pilot for the Coast Guard. But he's giving us some really good support, and we need to support him. Now, I want to uh, point out this URL here, tinyurl.com slash auxscoutlinks2. A-U-X-S-C-O-U-T is all uppercase. So uh, please copy down this uh, address. There are a whole bunch of really good resources available to you. I'll just leave this up on the screen for a moment so that you can copy it down. Um, and incidentally, I will um, post this PowerPoint uh, to the web tomorrow. Um, and I will send the uh, address to your uh, district staff officers as well as to uh, my uh, staff, and you can uh, download a copy of it. Um, okay, so uh, here are a few things I wanted to mention to you. Um, we're expecting a revised SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, to get issued pretty soon. Um, we're not exactly sure when that's going to happen. I saw a copy of it about a week and a half ago, and there's only one really significant change in it. All of the other rules that we've been living by are not changing. The one uh, significant change that I wanted to mention to you is that an FSOAS position is going to be authorized. Now, um, the chief director's office is anxious to point out that a flotilla should not just appoint an FSOAS if they don't have an active need for somebody in that role. But let's say that your flotilla is chartering a Sea Scout ship or you're partnering with the ship uh, and you need to have a principal point of contact within the flotilla, that is a really good reason to have an FSOAS. This position is not authorized as of today, but when the SOP comes out, that change will happen. So again, we don't have an FSOAS position yet. In the meantime, if a flotilla commander wants to appoint a flotilla Sea Scout coordinator or something like that, an ad hoc appointment, that's within his or her uh, authority to do, but you won't be able to put that into AUX data until the position has been authorized. And speaking of AUX data, um, as you know, they are uh, resystemizing that as we speak, and AUX data 2 is going to get rolled out in the next few weeks. The, thing, the changes that I'm about to mention to you will not be in the day one rollout. There are a couple of significant changes that will be added 
in a bit, but I'm guessing that it'll probably be two or three months before it'll get rolled into aux data. The first one that we mentioned a little earlier is that currently aux data can only capture youth protection training completion data. Um, we will be adding other BSA training codes for the training courses that you're required to take, things like Sea Scout Adult Leader Basic Training and, youth, uh, and um, uh, Safety Afloat and Safe Swim Defense uh, come to mind, but they won't be in the day one rollout of Aux Data 2. The other one that won't be is the FSOAS position will not be in the day one rollout. And while we're talking about AUX data, I want to remind you that all of the hours that you're putting into AUX Scout uh, should be reflected in your hours forms. So if you are a uh, BSA member, you should be putting in the comments field of every one of your hours forms, operation code AUXSCO2. If you are not a BSA member, you should be putting the code, operation code AUXSCO1 only on the forms that relate to what you're doing for Ox Scout and the Sea Scouts. I realize that that's a different approach, but this is what Coast Guard headquarters wants. I'm hoping that eventually when uh, when AUX data 2 is a little bit more mature, that there will just be a checkbox that you'll be able to uh, check when you input your hours into AUX data. Um, so um, in closing, let, let me just take a quick look to see if there were uh, other questions that we needed to cover. Um, I, I'm sorry, by scanning it this way, I'm probably not going to see everything that's really important. Oh, there was one comment that uh, one of the DSOs mentioned, and I happen to know that his comment is true of at least one other district. Um, you remember that we are talking about how to send in your youth protection training completion information. I gave you the nationally approved procedure. Some districts have decided to handle it a different way. So you might want to just double check with your district staff officer for Ox Scout to make sure that that's the way your youth protection training completion is supposed to be sent in. Your district may be different. I happen to know that uh, 9th Central and uh, 13th do it differently. And there may be other districts that are doing it differently. Um, if I haven't answered your questions uh, this evening, please uh, email me uh, afterwards and I'll do my best to respond to your questions. Let me close with a few uh, uh, thoughts to keep in mind. Let's keep things moving. Attend local electronic meetings. A lot of Sea Scout ships are having electronic meetings. This might be a great way for you to get out to some units that you would have trouble getting to anyway for distance or commute time or whatever. See what you can do to get invited to one of these meetings and maybe you can make a presentation or maybe you can just teach a skill that the Sea Scouts want. Have an active presence on social media. Um, does your flotilla or division or district have a social media presence? Uh, what are you doing to promote Ox Scout as a part of that? Write articles about what's going on with Sea Scouts in your district. Work with Bill Smith on that. He knows the tricks of the trade that will help you to be successful. Um, the thing that I want to say is that with all of the stuff going on in the world, there are a lot of people sitting at home with a lot of time on their hands, and this is our opportunity to fill it with good stuff that really will make a difference. This is our ch chance to really shine. So in closing, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening. 
please let me know what you liked and what you felt could have been done differently with this forum. Send me an email, and my email address is on the screen. Also, please let me know what workshops you'd like to see put on. Uh, we finished our initial battery. We've done about 30 workshops so far. Uh, we're here for you, and maybe there are some topics that we haven't covered that would really uh, meet your needs or maybe some other people who uh, you're working with. So I'd like to close by thanking you for everything you do. Our next forum is going to be on July 6th at uh, 2100 Eastern Time. I'm sure you can do the math to convert it to your local time zone. So thanks once again, and good night, everyone. Keep the faith and stay safe.